Doug Branson is back to talk about his time at the Spectrum Center in attendance for that Thunder game. The Hornets are interviewing a new, interesting head coaching candidate. And then Doug finishes out his thoughts overall on the Charlotte Hornets weekend. Today, I'm Locked On Hornets. You are Locked On Hornets, your daily Charlotte Hornets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, in a minute, cuz we live. We live. <laughs> Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free and available anywhere you get your podcast, and that includes YouTube. This episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. I'm Walker Mail. You can listen to me on WFNZ every week day from 12 to 3 p.m. That's Doug Branson. He's back after I went solo yesterday. He was traveling back from Charlotte to his hometown currently in Nashville. You can find his work on his sub stack every Hornets box score.com. This is the same Doug Branson where the voice of the Charlotte Hornets Sam Farber texted me and said Walker I think I just saw your co-host on the Simba cam <laughs> on the Jumbotron. And then, and then a couple of hours later, I get the pictures from Doug Branson, him holding his sweet child on the Simba cam. Her her introduction to Hornets fan base in, in, in a way that I enjoy, like her being the Simba and Doug being Mufasa, showing the baby that Doug has talked about for the last couple of years. So I have a baby. The very excuse when Doug messes up on something, here it is to all of Charlotte. Thank you for getting to uh, meet her at the Spectrum Center. And so I wanted to know exactly, was that like the biggest highlight of the week for you? Oh, for sure. For me, yeah. I mean, I don't know. You know, uh, the baby is is probably not old enough to ever remember this. She'll see some pictures. But this this really was all about me. Uh, I'm glad I got on the Jumbotron. Um, yeah. I can give you, you know, later on in the show, I'll give you a little tease for people to stick around. If you want to be, if you want to attend the games and be on the Jumbotron, I've got a four step guide uh, that will get you on the Jumbotron every single time. So stick around for that. Uh, but yeah, big weekend for me. I was on the Jumbotron twice. Uh, and, and it was all because of that cute kid that I was holding. Uh, so yeah, and it was a fun game. I mean, exciting game to be, and it didn't look, it didn't look that way in the first, in the first half. And really, I mean, four minutes left to go in the third quarter, they were down 10 points. And, and I looked at uh, my brother who was also in attendance and I said, I don't think they're going to win this game. Sorry, buddy. (laughs) Brought you to a stinker and, uh, the Hornets offense turned it up, man. What an exciting finish to that game. It, it was not a stinker. That was a fun game. That they, they were there in the fourth quarter until you had the Chet Holmgren and Isaiah Joe, you know, like ghost inverted pick and pop action, and then that was eventually Ooh. it. Brandon Miller's shot goes begging at the end. Still a lot of fun. And this was the title of the episode yesterday, Doug. The offense is back. The Hornets score over 120 points and the win against Orlando, who is a very good defensive team, and then against the Thunder, who's just a really good team. Period. They almost win that game at home. And so this was a fun weekend for Charlotte Hornets basketball. Like, Doug, I I talked about Steve Clifford, who said in his press conference that he was talking about him stepping down as head coach. He said he really wanted to finish strong in the last seven, six games or so. We're like, okay, yeah, that matters. I that matters. We also would like to hear more information on, you know, what led to this decision more so. And he gave us that. But he really is finishing strong here at least the last couple of games that they played what did you notice specifically in attendance watching uh, the Hornets against the Thunder well yeah I think there's one thing that I took away from being that close to the action as opposed to watching it closely on television and that's that the Hornets are so undersized and it really shows up when you're in the arena more so than even on television and looking just across the board starting lineup bench didn't matter and they they didn't even have SGA in this game this was a perfect trap game for OKC no SGA fifth game of a five game road trip the Hornets have been home forever sleeping in their own beds feeling good Uh, so this this really had the makings of a trap game and but but you look across the board it wasn't just Chet Holmgren like all of the matchups there was either a si- a strength disparity or a size disparity and in some cases whoever was guarding Giddy I mean Giddy was Giddy up he was just fast you know could, couldn't stop him especially in transition Hornets had trouble getting back 
So, you know, I mean, I, I think as much as we talk about shooting, as much as we talk about defense at the point of attack, those are all important things. But I think fundamentally this team and, – and injuries are a part of it, right? LaMelo is big for point guard. Uh, Mark Williams provides you size. So injury is a part of this. But this Hornets team fundamentally has to go out and trade – some of these smaller players for bigger players and have some size that are going to go. That's OKC is where they are right now. They're young, they're inexperienced, but they are where they are right now because they're super athletic, they're super big, they're super long, and and they can get shots that other teams can't. Yeah, this is what, again, this is what we discussed. I think it was against the Magic. It was either on March 5th or March 19th, one of the other two games that they played against Orlando within the past month's worth of time where he said, yeah, we're small. Because remember, in one of those games, the second half, the Magic just dunked everything. And Steve, like, look, we're going to be small the rest of the year. I think that was the time where he revealed to everybody that Mark Williams wasn't coming back. It was against Orlando. And this was, it's a realization that you have. In fact, Steve Clifford just leaning all the way into it because he's starting Grant Williams despite having Nick Richards available. Now, he told us again that was because of the Chet Holmgren matchup. But it is, it's also your best unit and this is with Nick Richards slamming a couple of himself like that was a fun center battle especially more so in the second half with Nick Richards catching some nasty lobs that was really cool but you're right there's there's nothing you can do about it and that you there's only so many ways you can say we're tiny at every single position but we all know what it is and then we just have to try to figure out other ways to combat that yeah yeah and it's not a coincidence that you know Nick Richards comes back from this uh, uh foot injury and, and he comes off the bench. I don't think that was injury management. I think that was Steve Clifford who has really just said, hey, we, we are functional on offense when Grant Williams is at the five. But well, just he not... told us that after the game. Like he was, yeah. it, was, it was the Holmgren matchup as to why they did that. Yeah, and so, uh, and, and, and so they've got to figure that out. How do they play functionally offensively? Maybe the answer is, you know, get LaMelo back. Maybe it's as simple as that. Maybe it's as simple as Brandon Miller bulks up. And then because th the size is an issue on both ends of the floor, but for different reasons, right? I think defensively, it's, you know, you don't have a ton of length down low. It's tough to defend the rim when you don't have that size. But offensively, you know, Grant Williams, as much as we want to talk about that game being about OKC, the four players that came over from OKC to Charlotte, they all played well. Everybody scored in double figures. That was definitely the big story of the game. But Grant Williams scoring five straight in the fourth quarter, uh, you know, helped propel them and, and, get, and keep them close. And, and it was his strength inside, being able to finish through contact that not a lot of players on this team are capable of right now. And it, it's it's difficult to score, especially on a team that doesn't have shooting, because you drive and you kick and you miss. There's not enough threats of drive and actually make. Uh, and if Meechus is not hitting threes, then the offense is a complete disaster. And so, that, or I mean, Brandon. I think. Or Brandon. Or Brandon. Or, or right? Brandon, who, yeah, first half, terrible, right? One of seven. Yeah, awful. And, and if he's not scoring, Brandon, game, yeah. and this isn't a critique of Brandon, really, it's just a reality that if Brandon's not scoring, he's not impactful. He did have three blocks. He did step it up a little bit on the defensive end in the second half, too. But if he's not scoring, because he his playmaking just isn't there yet, he's not. He's kind of a ghost on the floor. I, I, I at the, after the first half, I was like, I, I think Brandon played. I'm pretty sure he played. I, I don't know. Yeah, even even defensively, there was the time I, I remember a, a Wiggins drive that seemed pretty easy for him against Brandon, and and you've seen some of those drives against Brandon. But yeah, it, that that's the thing about Brandon is he is such a good shooter. If he goes one of eight, it's going to be really tough. It, it's crazy, right? That Miles Bridges hit a huge three in the fourth quarter, where it was one of those no no yes shots where he just decides to take it from the wing and it feels like they could have gotten into their offense a little more but he decided to do the hero step back thing not even really step back just a set shot and he made it and it was a monster shot I mean they needed every bit of that and so that's what allowed them to stick with it uh, including some Michich drives thought he was really good that they got to the rim and that's what was really cool about that that fourth quarter was fun as hell man it was cool to be competitive in the waning seconds against one of the best teams in the NBA. Yeah, and it was Brandon Miller, it was Brandon Miller's drive and his ability to finish That's, through contact yeah, occasionally too, that yeah. that that really allowed them to be even within striking distance um after Joe hit that three. But uh br back to that Bridges shot. I wrote this in my notes. Bridges' mid-range step back is really the ultimate barometer for how hot and confident the Hornets' offense is, right? Like, if that thing goes in, anything could go in. Anything is possible at that point. And if it doesn't go in, then you know 
things have things have gone really wrong. The offense was good. Uh, lots of shot making, you know, really, really efficient basketball for the Hornets getting to the right spots too. like instead of just shooting all these mid range jumpers, which the Hornets are very good at. And that itself is not very good. They actually got to good spots in the NBA game. So it was really cool to see this weekend. And, and look, Chet's a freak. I mean, I, that was, I, I was sad yep. that SGA didn't play because I wanted to see him too, but like, I really, I really, really wanted. To, well, I wanted to see Brandon Miller in action, and I wanted to see Chet Holmgren. Those were the two that I was keeping an eye on. And you really, you don't get a full appreciation for how. And it's not, it's not the block shots, and it's not, it's not even how tall and how long he is. All of that is is a little bit freaky. It's his ability to handle the basketball and pass, like, and and no more on display than on that shot where he drew the double or on the uh, the Joe shot when he drew the double team and got it back out to Joe. Like that's just I just threw my hands up. I don't know, you probably see it on the broadcast. I just threw my hands up like, what are you, what the hell are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? He he did some what are you supposed to do stuff in that early in the first quarter where, oh, okay, is, is this just something that Chet just takes over? And that that wasn't necessarily the case. Like they actually got the best of him every once in a while defensively, who he's a great defensive player, but it there were some wow moments from him very early in this game. And so yeah, they take on the top two picks of that draft a couple of years ago back to back. Paolo Boncaro, great game from Paolo, except for the shooting outside, and then very nice game from Chet. They win one, they lose one, but still a fun weekend overall. Let's get to the next segment coming up next on the Locked On Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. The Charlotte Hornets are granted permission to interview Sacramento Kings G League coach Lindsey Harding. You might remember her playing for Duke back in the day. We'll get to that interview in just a moment on uh, Locked On Hornets. This episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. And LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or resources to hire. LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make the process easier. They even just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making the process even easier and quicker. In fact, two and a half million small businesses businesses use LinkedIn for hiring post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA that's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free terms and conditions apply more locked on Hornets ahead Doug we got some breaking news from Woj last night around 7 30 and had a write-up on ESPN in no time saying that the Sacramento Kings G League coach Lindsey Harding will interview for the Charlotte Hornets head coaching job, sources told ESPN on Monday. A little bit more a part of that story. Woj writes, in her first season as coach of the Stockton Kings, Harding was voted the 2024 G League Coach of the Year and advanced her team to the Western Conference Finals. Charlotte was granted permission on Monday to interview her for the job. And if you remember Lindsey Harding's name a little bit, it's because she played here locally. She's 39 years old. She was the number one overall pick in the 2007 WNBA draft and played nine seasons in the W before joining the Philadelphia 76ers and Sacramento Kings as a development coach. Doug, what are your thoughts on Lindsey Harding interviewing for the Charlotte Hornets head coaching vacancy? I'm thrilled that the Hornets are are casting a wide net and that they are getting, you know, really getting all of these creative young minds in and they're not putting any limitations on on the types of people that they are bringing in I, I just think that that's an exceptional way to run a, a head coaching search for a, a young team that is going to need I think a creative young voice in and, and there are so many talented uh, female coaches out there who have not gotten enough opportunities I think in the NBA and there's so much talent and creativity out there that's just untapped and so you know I think it's fantastic that she's getting an interview and she is uh, extremely qualified you just mentioned I mean has played at the top of 
the the college sport and was the what number one overall draft pick in the WNBA, played many seasons there, and now is getting G League Coach of the Year and an opportunity to take that developmental team to a championship. And look, this <laughs> this Hornets team is going to need a lot of player development. So if she's you know if she's considered one of the top people to do that, then I then I think that's that's excellent. I, I'm torn on this though because saying all of that, Walker. Here's my concern. The, with the first hire of a female head coach in the NBA, there will come a lot of media attention. There will come a lot of scrutiny, and, and there's going to come with it's going to come with a lot of pressure. And I really, I've always felt this way uh, when when we've talked about this subject around the NBA circles. That, I, or my, my hope at least, was that when it happened, and it it will happen, and when it happens, I hope that it's with an organization that is functional enough to deal with all that is going to come with that. Um, and so like when, when Hammond was, was in line maybe to take over for pop before she moved on to the aces and the WNBA, I thought that was like perfect, you know, perfect transition into an organization that has just done really everything right from a front office down to a player development draft, everything they've done everything right. And so it would just be an easy slot to make. With the Hornets, I'm more concerned. Now, I get it. New ownership group, you know, blank slate maybe, but they're, they've are they retained a lot of that old organization as they transition into whatever this thing is going to become. And so, Walker, I don't know if you feel this way. I'm just concerned that this team is has not proven that they are functional enough as an organization to, to deal with all of that and that they would get in the way almost – get in the way of Lindsey Harding or whoever that first female head coach would be, get in the way of her success. You want this to go right for Lindsey Harding wherever she gets the head coaching job. And yeah. if you don't feel like that can happen with the Charlotte Hornets, I understand all of those feelings. If the Charlotte Hornets feel that Lindsey Harding is the best candidate for the job, then the Hornets can say, bleep you, we're going to hire her if they really want to. And Correct. so if that's the case, then fantastic. But you're right. Like we can have those feelings of we want it so badly to go right for Lindsay Harding, because if she doesn't, the scrutiny unjustified, maybe unjustified, she's going to have to go through so many different things compared to what a men's head coach would have to in the NBA, because it's the first time that we would be seeing this. And so the scrutiny might be something where she has to get through it, even if a 500 season with the Hornets, it, that might be scrutinized by the fan base for her. But if it was Charles Lee, maybe, was, well, we got to give him time. I just hope, I hope that wouldn't be the case here. Yeah. Um. I, I hope that she would have every uh, available resource to thrive in Charlotte there is a new regime, but we're also the team that has every single one of their owners on the pyramid of worst owners in NBA history, every single one of them conducted right. by the ringer. And all of them, speaking of justified, all of those decisions are understandable with MJ, Bob Johnson, and of course, George Shin being on that pyramid. I, I hope that a new regime here in this city allows for you to have the idea that this can go well, even if experience might tell you otherwise. Because the nightmare scenario, right, Walker, is that you have the first female head coach in NBA history, and then, again, a, a, no, a non-functional organization, if it all went really wrong you know, in the first half of the season, maybe some of that's in, in her control and maybe some of it's not, and they pull the plug mid-season first year, that would have to set back you know, the next crop of, of female head coaching opportunities or even assistant coaching opportunities. I, I, I wouldn't want that to happen, right? But you're totally right. If she's extremely qualified and this organization uh, gets her into the room, by the way, qualified, I just want to say this, like, because, you know, you, you look at some comments when when this news came out and and people are, people will say, well, you know, there's Jordi Fernandez who's in her same organization who's already a lead assistant on an NBA bench. They're talking to a lot of assistants that are already lead assistants, assistants on an NBA bench. And so those guys are more qualified than than she is. Or they'll even look at a Don Staley and say, Don Staley just won a championship in 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 the the, the top, you know, league there in, in in women's college basketball. And so she's more qualified. If you've ever hired someone for a job, you quickly begin to understand that qualifications matter, but they are not the end all be all. What's on a sheet of paper is not the end all be all. You get someone in a room and you find out if that person jives with what you want out of the position. 
you got you you're going to go into this job and and I think that that uh, Rick and Gabe are going to do this. They're going to have a list of things that they want to hear from the person that they're going to hire. And they're going to check those boxes. And they're going to find out, hey, do we get along? Do we see eye to eye on what the future of this organization looks like and what you have to focus on to win in the NBA? And and uh, Clifford might be part of that conversation too if he's still in the if he's still in the organization. And so that's that's what it's going to be about. It, it, you know, and and I think she's plenty qualified already. But but to to, to focus on that, I, I think is silly. So Walker, here's the question, and this is the question I've I've been getting uh, on the subtext and on and in my text. What are the chances that this actually happens for the Hornets? What do you think? I don't think very high because I think that there are other extremely qualified candidates that have been in the mix for quite some time. I mean, Charles Lee is the one that is the leader in the clubhouse. The fact that we have seen familiarity win out in so many of the hiring practices with this new regime and you have that with Charles Lee on top of the qualifications being impressive on top of him seemingly being a great interview and having this jovial personality somebody that people want to work with it it feels hard to sway from that guy like he is going to be the target but also there are a couple of other candidates like Jordy Fernandez where it is an understandable argument that Fernandez is already higher up within that very organization in which we're talking about about Lindsey Harding. Now you're right too. If the interview process favors Lindsey Harding, Jalen Slauson is out here after playing for her saying, Hey, she deserves to be a head coach in the NBA and just hit giving a glowing review. And mm-hmm. then you feel the relationship part of it that she might have as a coach with the players that are playing and fighting and scratching for her. Then yeah, that makes a big difference too. I totally understand your point and, and gr- agree with it emphatically, but like the qualifications, the coaching tree stuff too, you know, I do think that stuff matters as well, as far as where they might grab some of their ideas And if Charles Lee is grabbing from so many different things like Quinn Snyder, like Mike Budenholzer, like Darvin Ham, like some of these other coaches that have been celebrated, then it's reasonable to put him at the top. I don't think it's going to happen with Lindsey Harding, but I will say the way that players talk about her, which is something I put a lot of stock into, like if, if a lot of players tell you, hey, I love this coach, I think they've done a great job then yeah, I put a lot of stock into that. And hopefully she becomes a coach one day. Like it's, and the Don Staley thing is something you bring up as well. It feels like she would have, that hire would have a higher approval rating. One, because you're a little more hyper-local. Lindsey Harding played at Duke, but she's been out of sight, out of mind for a long time here in the area. Where Don Staley is in your face winning championships and going undefeated. You win some, you lose none. It's an amazing graphic for that South Carolina team. And Don Staley seemingly has the personality that meshes extremely well with players, as we've seen since she won the first championship in like 2017, with prominent WNBA players right now, like Asia Wilson, who might be the best player in that league. So you have some extremely qualified candidates who are women, and it it might happen soon. I don't think it happens with Lindsey Harding going to Charlotte, Doug, but it might just happen soon with the way that these players love those coaches. I'm going to give you an argument here that says that it's a higher probability of happening than you may think. Okay. Because if now if you just look historically, we don't have a ton of history on this new regime, but if you just look historically over the hires and the moves they've made, I think you can say there's one common denominator, and that's that Rick Schnall and Gabe Plotkin, it, some of this being connections with Jordan, some of this being connections with Atlanta, their moves make sense in the context of who they've been around and who they trust and 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 who they've been accustomed to to working with in the past, right? I mean, you look down the line, Peterson, and then you know, uh, moving Cupcheck back into the front office somewhere. He's got, I don't know, he's got some clo- he's got some closet office somewhere, I guess. Still, um, but all of these moves have have made sense within that context. But at the same time, they are both Schnall and Plotkin. I think come from the finance world, the, and particularly Plotkin from the hedge fund world, right? And these guys love to zig when everybody else is zagging and zag when everybody else is zigging. That, that's the whole, the whole hedge fund thing is like, let's find a gap here where people aren't thinking about something and let's go invest in it and let's make a lot of money, right? And so, you know, and same with these Silicon Valley guys that, that take over these teams. Um, they they, they want to like try to find what's that thing that nobody else is thinking about that I'm going to go in and take advantage of. It's not sort of the traditional business mentality of sort of do the safe thing and, and ride the safe thing and buy the bond. These guys, these guys don't want to buy the bond. They want to buy the, the hot stock, the penny stock that nobody's thinking about that they can take to $100 a share. 
So that's where I look at a Lindsey Harding and I go, look, they've made all these comfortable hires. If th- this head coaching thing is really the last big one that they're going to do for a while, I'm, I've got a feeling that they may – they may look for an opportunity here to do something that no one else has done because it might come with a ton of risk, but it also comes with a huge reward if it all works out. Yeah, it, it may be. The hiring practices here, as far as the basketball stuff, it all has been familiar and comfortable every single step of the way. And you're right about that. With Rick Schnall having been a part of the Hawks organization, then they go out and they get Jeff Peterson as the GM. Yes, also with the Hawks franchise. He hires Dotun Akinwali as his assistant GM. Guess what? They knew each other with the Hawks, and now maybe Charles Lee could be the head coach who spent a lot of time with Mike Budenholzer or in Atlanta. So a lot of familiarity here. Or they zag. I'm telling you, watch for the zag. Or they zag. Or they zag. I'm telling you, I'm just saying, if it happens, (laughs) I'm going to look like a genius, and if it doesn't, no one's going to remember. (laughs) <laughs> you'll have to apologize is what you'll have to I do all right uh, coming up next on the locked on hornets podcast don't go to sleep on the hornets just yet we'll get doug's finishing thoughts on what he saw from the hornets over the weekend maybe get his thoughts on that orlando magic win and brandon miller's incredible first half all coming up next on locked on hornets This episode is brought to you by Game Time. We appreciate Game Time as always for helping us out here on the Locked On Podcast Network. And Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace for Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch. It's great for procrastinators like me. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets tickets so what you can do is you can go to game time the game time app gametime.com and check out the priority last minute deals flash deals zone deals so many different ways to save money when buying these tickets take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time download the game time app create an account and use code locked on nba for 20 dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create an account and redeem code l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n nba that's locked on nba for twenty dollars off download game time app today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed more locked on hornets ahead i know the main event is the four-step process on how to show up on the jumbotron at the center i get it we'll get to it i did just want to real quickly get to your thoughts on the brandon miller first half against orlando where Mm -hmm. doug like watching that first half that felt like the the best heat check rationale I've seen where you have they're they're not crazy shots. They're not let me pull up from 35 feet because I'm so hot and basically just waste this possession. But you're taking fadeaway sideline three pointers. They're still yeah. really very difficult, but also like, OK, I could see where you get that. It, it, I, I hate the heat check possession as far as the basketball nerddom in me, but also love it if it goes in as the fan. I thought we got a perfect marriage between still decent enough shots, still heat check shots, got free lanes to the rim, except for a couple times, and then he was able to capitalize on that. A perfect storm to go 10 of 10 in that first half. And if he was playing with LaMelo Ball, he would have had a 40-piece. I mean, the only reason that he was – well, there are a couple of reasons why he was stoppable in the second half. A lot of it has to do with the fact that he's a rookie, that he's got to put some some bulk on. He's got to – he has to improve his playmaking so that teams feel like he's a threat to move the basketball and they can't double, triple team him every single possession in the second half and force the ball out of his hands in awkward positions. You know, once his playmaking starts to accelerate, teams will be a little bit more scared. They'll have to adjust to that as well. I mean, that's what makes Jokic dangerous. That's what makes Paul George dangerous is that if you try to throw a double team at them, look at Chet. Chet did the same thing to them in the the Thunder game. So, you know, that's that's going to be key for him because there will come a day when, when Brandon is not stoppable in the second half. But had there been any other talent on there that was a threat that that Oklahoma would have had to consider then I think Brandon would have been a little bit more aggressive. I think it took a lot of discipline on Brandon's part not to force the issue and go after the 40-piece. Because, I mean, yes, he he didn't make a lot of shots in that second half, but he didn't miss a ton either. You know what I'm well, saying? He, like he, he wasn't, just didn't take many. He yeah, just didn't take right. them. And I think that's a recognition on his part of like, hey, I understand what the defense is doing to me right now. I, I, I think a lesser player – 
would have tried to fight through that and force it. He didn't. So kudos to Brandon. Great first half. And, you know, I, I just saw a clip of Dan Hurley, the UConn uh, coach, now two-time champion coach, and, and there was a clip of him, I guess, in his first season where UConn was getting smacked over the head. And he does this press conference and he says, get your shots in now because we're coming. Yeah. And that's how, <laughs> wow, I mean, amazing, amazing shot call. Babe Ruthian level shot call by Dan Hurley. But uh, but that's how I feel about Brandon Miller right now. Like, dude, go ahead, Magic. Get your double teams in now because in I, as soon as next year, you're not going to be able to do that anymore. Brandon Miller was crazy good in the first half, just didn't take enough shots. Still, the Hornets put up 120, and at least they got the win. Not so much against the Thunder. Any other thoughts on OKC before? Like, well, where do you want to take this with more tales from the arena, Doug? Well, I have two quick things before I do tales from the arena. One, Poku, another flex. Show him the bones. I need Eric. If you're listening right now, I give you. You can steal it. Don't. I don't. I just want to hear it said on air. I want someone to say, "Show him the bones." When Poku does the flex next time, so that that also he reminds. Did you watch the movie Little Giants? Oh, it's been a while, but yes, I have seen. But it. there's the scene where the, they're doing sort of the montage of the team yep. getting ready, and the nerdy kid is like flexing. Sure. It's, I mean, every time it's he like does a, it, I think it's a, a meme now, right? Like I'm sure I've seen that. <laughs> yeah, where it's it's so clearly hilarious. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, also, speaking of Eric Collins, after the game, I thought it was funny that Trey Mann was doing the you know group picture with his former teammates, and Eric uh, showing his cards a little bit said, "Well." Modern NBA for you. He was not a fan of taking pictures of the team after a close loss. What say you, fair or foul? Well, well, I, I think it's fair. Like, I, I don't have – I'm not the old school guy, I guess, in that regard. But I will say, too, did you see Davies Bertans trying to get in there as well? And apparently they were leaving him out. Like, it was the whole, can I get dapped? And then they just don't even pay attention to it for a while, which I thought was funny. I only saw two pictures. I didn't see the video, but the pictures told a story that wasn't exactly welcoming of their old teammate. No, well, but I think I, I was trying to research this a little bit, and it seemed like from what I gathered, Davis was like, you guys take the picture. He It was okay. more so like he could have been in the picture, but I guess Trey had maybe been around a little bit longer. I'm not sure what the what, – whatever it was, Davis was like, I'm good. You guys take the picture. And I feel that because like, I okay. – <laughs> I'm very much yeah well yeah of course they were like all right see you see you DB no right. one no what? one was like he was waiting yeah there, there could have been that situation where he was like waiting for them to be like no 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 no, come on and they were like okay right, cool <laughs> all right we'll see you yeah great game <laughs> but people were trying to make a thing of Poku too like nobody likes Poku and then I saw a video I was watching I watched a little bit of the set or I watched the second half after I got home and um and it seemed like Poku was dapping guys up. So people like to make make things of this. But anyway, That's I don't true. have a problem with it either. I would have a problem with it if the Hornets were in the same conference and in playoff contention. Then I think don't take the picture. But if you've, you're not even won 20 games, the other team's heading to the Western Conference playoffs, it's fine. It's whatever. Yeah, well, yeah and you have so many different players that were traded from that very team. I, it's yeah. it it would be different as well. It, I guess it wouldn't be happening if there weren't so many different players from the team that it, Jeff Peterson just decided, or I, Rick Schnall and Gabe Plotkin decided to go after. So yes, the Poku flex, Poka flex, uh, Poka flexki, I think is what the Hornets <laughs> uh, social media was rolling with. Great job by Show the bones. Or social media. That was fantastic. Um, what else you got for us? All right, four step plan to get on the jumbotron. Are you ready? So ready. All right, number four, be entertaining, but don't be too weird. You have to you have to toe that line. I almost went over the line on the second time I was on the jumbo trying. I got a little intense, a little too. I was I was trying to. It was during that fourth quarter timeout with like less than a minute to go, and I was just trying to really rally. And I had the kid in my, I had the kid in one arm, and I was you know getting really intense. I was almost over the line to too weird. But you have to be entertaining. You have to capture the camera, but you can't be too weird, or they're going to cut away. Because did it's you a, do it's the a, dad thing? Affair. Did you do the dad thing of having the kid in one hand and a beer in the other? Because fans absolutely love that. I uh, know I did the uh, I did the economical thing and did all the beers pre going into the arena. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. <laughs> like, <laughs> I did. I do know what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was trying to save a little moolah. So no, I um, no, I didn't. But I had the kid in one hand, and that's that's well, we'll get to that in a second. Number okay. three, find you got to find the camera person. Okay. And number three is kind of connected to number two, which is you got look. I, this is this is a tough thing to say because I my first season tickets were on the upper level. I love being in the upper level. It's where the real fans are. But but if you want to be on the jumbotron, 
I mean, you got to be on the lower level. Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. they don't shoot the upper level as much. Not as much, no. Nope. And and so you, but then then when you're on the lower level, you got to find the camera. You got to look at the camera. Per- you got to make eye contact occasionally, and so that they know, hey, I'm going to do some things because they want to find entertaining mm-hmm. people that, again that they don't go to that weird line, try to take your shirt off or anything like that. But they want to find that. That's their job. And so if you can have a little eye contact, body language relationship with a camera person, you will get on the Jumbotron. But the final thing is what we've been teasing all along. You got to hold a cute kid. I think there's a there might be a service here. You know, there might be a uh, there might be a hold a cute kid service that you if people want to get on the Jumbotron, you just rent your kid out. Nothing could go wrong with that. Nothing. No. There's no but- no, no risk, no safety issue with that at all. Some kind of business, Branson's babies, get on the jumbo tron with my kids. <laughs> I have a baby. We'll call it I have a baby because I have one. And, you know, if you want to get on the jumbo tron, uh, beers are expensive. Give me a few dollars. All right. There you go. That'll do it. That is your four step <laughs> Wait, no, process. I've got, I've got more tales from the arena. You ready? Yes, I am. Okay. The concessions and the general vibe of, of the arena, probably reflective of the Hornets record, a little sad. There was okay. a there was a Chick Fil A stand that had a sign over it that just said Uptown Cafe, and they weren't even selling chicken tenders. <laughs> okay. uh, no, no, not a, not a ton for kids, not a ton for fans, not a ton for fans. Obviously, it's the end of the season; it's been a rough season. I hope that Rick and Gabe these arena things that they're going to do. I hope that they elevate all of the process. Let's restart it. Let's try to get the let's try to get the groove back because the 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 arena was sad. Also. Look, it got loud in the fourth quarter, but man, I mean, I, I hate to sound like, what was it, Steve Kerr? or uh, so, No, it wasn't Steve Kerr. It was somebody making a comment on the Golden State Warriors arena experience. Maybe it was the Suns head coach or something, or I might have that backwards. Maybe it was Kerr talking I about think it the was Suns. Kerr. I think it was Kerr. It's so artificially loud. It, it, there weren't a ton of people. It got exciting at the end, but man, they pumped the music so loud in there. I hate to be like old guy here. But it's like it's so artificially loud because if they didn't play the music that loud, you would understand like, oh, there's not a lot going on here. Man, I can't wait until that arena is actually loud again because in that fourth quarter, you got a little bit of preview of it. When Spectrum Center gets rocking, don't come and knock it. It's it's pretty exciting. Yeah, well, that that's right. That's my whole thing, and that's what we've talked about. If you win, the fans will show up. We, we we got 500 last year and the fans showed up it's really not that hard it's a very simple formula as to how to get butts in the seats and they just haven't been rolling with that formula for the last couple of years any other tales from the arena that's it rick gabe it. get okay. on it get to work there i want when i when i come next time i want it to be a first class affair can't wait that'll do it for locked on <laughs> hornets uh thanks for making us your first listen we're free and available as always anywhere you get your podcast that includes youtube hit the notification button so you know when we drop an episode and subscribe above all make sure you do subscribe have a great rest of your day we'll be back with you tomorrow Bye bye.